She was a young girl enjoying the little moments of happiness with her young friends. As she held the deaf and her friends along with her sang poetry of Jahiliya in the house of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As this was going on, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he entered the house saying, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she responded. But the, the singing or the, 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 the expression of happiness that was going on in the house of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not stop. Then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went to the covered portion of his house and he covered himself with a cloak, with a cloth, with a blanket and he faced the wall opposite to Aisha. So Aisha radiallahu anha is on this side and he is facing towards the wall. And the singing and the expression of happiness continues. And it becomes loud enough that people in the masjid of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could hear the laughs and the sounds coming out of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's house. At this point, it became pretty obvious that Abu Bakr had to do something because it was his daughter. So he entered the house of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, the sounds of shaitan in the house of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, i.e. singing is taking place in the house of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At this moment, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he uncovered his head and he looked at Abu Bakr and he said, Da'ahum ya Abu Bakr. Leave them alone, Abu Bakr. Fa inna hadha yawmul Eid. Today is the day of Eid. Fa inna hadha yawmul Farah. Today is the day of happiness. Today is the day of expressing happiness. Then Abu Bakr continued talking to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha radiallahu anha continued what she was doing. But moments later, <coughs> she winked at her friends, saying, it's enough. We should stop. They packed up and they're gone. See, the story ends over here. But there are a lot of lessons for our daily lives in this story. For every single one of us. First and foremost, Islam is not against you expressing happiness at the moments of happiness. We see this time and again in the seerah of Prophet ﷺ when somebody would enter, for example, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he entered after a long, he was living in Abyssinia, he came back, there was a reception for him. When Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, there was a reception for him. Moments of happiness, we are rather not commanded, but we are allowed and it is recommended to us to joyfully express our happiness, making sure that we do not transgress the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where does it become a problem? When we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the moments of happiness, for He was verily the one who put you in the happiness in the first place. That's where the problem happens. So express your happiness, stay in the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there's nothing wrong with that. The next thing we learn over here, that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is mentioned that when he would walk out towards an enemy, they could feel his ru'ub, they could feel the awe that was emanating from Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a distance of a camel ride of 30 days. Now ask yourself this question. Where did this awe 
go when he entered the house of Prophet ﷺ. Why did not Aisha and her friends radiallahu anhuma, why did they not stop singing? There's another hadith of Prophet ﷺ that tells us why this happened. Aisha radiallahu anh, long after the death of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was asked, describe to us how Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was in the house. And he said, She said, He was excessive in his smile and his laugh when he was in the house. How are we as men, including myself, when we come back from a long day of work, are we that happiness that our families look after, look forward towards? Or are we this lion that he, the minute we enter, all the rats run away? Ask yourself these questions. Do your kids line up at the door waiting for Baba to come in? Are they eager to jump and hug you? Or do they not even say salam to you when you enter? You see, it's very easy to be a macho man. It's very easy to be this manly figure in the house. But most of the time, those same individuals, when you see them at work, they're extremely coward. They have no self-respect and dignity. You see, every one of you is here to work. Whatever your work is, do it with dignity, do it with honor. Do not let anybody disrespect you for whatever. And remember that your rizq is written and no one's going to take that away. And this usually happens because we're frustrated from work and we cannot take out our frustration on the people at work. And then when we come back home, guess what? It's my realm, it's my game. It's my house and I'm going to take, do whatever it takes to get this frustration out. So next time when you enter your house, next time when you come back from work, remember these statements, these words of Aisha radiallahu anha, where she said, Dhahakan. See that she didn't say Dhahukan. She, she said Dhahakan, a superlative degree. He was excessive in his smile and his laughs in the house. <coughs> Another thing that you find over here is Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he entered and he recognized that the girls are doing something but he had no interest in that It was beyond his maturity level So he didn't tell them stop that does not make sense at all What are you guys doing Allah did not send us for this we have akhirah he didn't say any of that he understood that in every age, every person's maturity level is different. And oftentimes as parents, that's one of the biggest mistakes we make. We put that child at the maturity level that I want him to be at. And we fail to see where he is actually at. And then we treat him like that. How could you spill the glass of water? It's a three-year-old kid. Right? This is the biggest problem we have, being able to deal with people with their level of intellect. Prophet ﷺ used to deal with people based on their intellect. The discussions that took place between Abu Bakr and Umar were different from the discussions that took place between Sahabis that came from the desert. Prophet ﷺ would acclimatize his language to the people coming from the desert so that they could understand him better. So one of the things we learned that Prophet ﷺ, he was not interested in that. So he turned his face away completely and gave total privacy to Aisha radiallahu anha which leads us to another lesson. See, privacy, a lot of times, we don't understand this concept. Every person needs their own space. 
Your small child that is with you needs his own space. Sometimes we don't realize why the child is acting like that. It's because he is, he, he is unable to express that he needs his own space. Every one of us needs to be left alone. Remind yourself of the time when you were given a task by your manager and you stand there and he stands on your head. Did you finish? Did you finish? Did you finish? When will it be done? When are you going to finish it? It's 2 o'clock. You told me 2 o'clock. Is it done? And how annoying it is. Or for the sisters, imagine if your husband comes and stands in front of you in the kitchen. Is the food ready yet? You said 2 o'clock. Why is it not ready? When is it going to be ready? How long is it going to take? Similarly, children, young children, every individual at their space, they need their privacy. And as parents, as adults, as managers, as people that you know, work in different fields, as a community, we need to understand that we all need some privacy. And Prophet ﷺ understood this 1500 years ago. Today they're talking about it in the, in the sciences and it's how important for the upbringing of the child. But we find the reminiscence of that in the actions of Nabi ﷺ. Another lesson that we learn in this story, and this is really interesting, and this is especially for the young couples or couples that have been married for five, six years. They're still having troubles. See, when Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he entered the house of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tried fixing something that he saw was wrong. So he thought, oh, what my daughter is doing does not befit the household of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr, the best man to walk on the face of this earth after Anbiya, after Prophets. Obviously, he had all the rights, so he entered. This is his daughter's house, and he tried interfering. What did Prophet ﷺ do? He stopped him right there. He didn't say, Qif, stop. He said, leave them alone, i.e., don't interfere. Da'hum. Leave them, don't interfere with them. You see, the lesson for us over here, sometimes the sisters with all their right intentions, they tell every little detail to their mother. And sometimes the brothers with all their right intentions tell every little de detail taking place between the husband and wife to the parents, to his parents, to his mother usually. And the mother is like, oh no, she's not respecting you. This is not how respect is. Look, this is the way I treated your dad. And on the other side is a similar story. It is not in the interest of a newly married couple or even an old couple for anyone to interfere in your household. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you as a man, qawam, responsible for that house. You can listen to the advice of your parents in the, in the marriage issues. You can listen to them, but you're not obliged to obey them when it comes to that. And that's where we go wrong. And then the guy and the girl, the husband and the wife, the spouses, they never get a chance to understand each other. Their understanding of one another is always built on the understanding of the relatives around them. And that's why I always tell people living in North America, in UK, in Europe, in Australia, it's not in your best interest to live with your parents when you get married. Find a house close by to your parents so you can still do the duties that Allah has commanded you to do towards your parents, to your mother. But living in the same house will cause these problems. Unless you are a person that is able to put a stop to these things from day one. No one interferes in my wife's affairs. And the wife does the same. No one interferes with my husband's affairs. This is a small example of how we need to ponder on the seerah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You've heard many speakers come and tell you, you know, read the seerah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Go and read it. Read it to your family. Have circles about your seerah. It's not about the story. Though the story is an integral part, it's more about how you draw practical daily lessons 
from these stories for your daily life. Only then does seerah of Prophet ﷺ becomes a source of inspiration to change behaviors and actions in everybody around us.